Well, thank you and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to uh, the final uh, panel session of West 2015 uh, and what I think uh, quite possibly uh, could be the best panel session uh, of the conference this week. Uh, ever since the uh, rebalance to the Pacific was announced a few years ago, uh, there's been a lot of discussion, uh, in, including in the pages of proceedings, about what exactly that might mean. Uh, not only for the United States, but our friends, our allies, uh, and others uh, in the region. So uh, to lead us through the discussion uh, this morning, uh, we're very fortunate to have as our moderator Dr. David M. Finkelstein, Vice President and Director of CNA's China Studies Division. He holds a PhD in Chinese history from Princeton University and is a graduate of the U.S. Military Academy at West Point, as well as the U.S. Army Command and General Staff College and the Army War College. In addition, he studied Mandarin Chinese at Nankai University. He is the author and editor of numerous publications, including From Abandonment to Salvation, Washington's Taiwan Dilemma, China's Leadership in the 21st Century, Rise of the Fourth Generation, Chinese Warfighting, the PLA Experience since 1949, China's Revolution and Doctrinal Affairs, Recent Trends in the Operational Art of the Chinese People's Liberation Army, and civil-military relations in today's China swimming in a new sea. A retired U.S. Army officer, Dr. Finkelstein held command and staff positions at the platoon, company, battalion, and major Army command levels. He also held significant China-related positions at the Pentagon as an advisor to the Secretary of Defense and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs. In addition, he served on the faculty at the United States Military Academy, where he taught Chinese history. Ladies and gentlemen, Please join me in welcoming Dr. David Finkelstein. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you, Paul, for that very generous introduction. Uh, thanks also to Admiral Daly and the terrific crew at U.S. Naval Institute for inviting me to moderate uh, this panel. And of course, thanks to friends at AFSEA at, as well. So as you just heard, for the past few years, I've been directing the China Studies Division at Center for Naval Analyses in Alexandria, Virginia. We have a relatively big uh, China division for a nonprofit. I have almost 20 China analysts every day uh, looking at the situation out there, all of whom are cleared, have professional level Mandarin, and have lived out in the region. So if you come to Alexandria, Virginia, uh, come, on, come on out and visit with us. So uh, much bigger than that, frankly, though, is the uh, panel that we have today and the topic we're going to discuss, uh, continuity and change in the Indo-Asia Pacific region. Now, if you go to the Pacific Command's website, they're fond of reminding people just how big the Indo-Asia Pacific region is, uh, and, and they've got all the statistics that go along with it. Admiral Keating is laughing. He probably put the website together. And there you can read that uh, the Indo-Asia Pacific is home to half the world's population in 36 countries that there's tremendous cultural, political, and geographic diversity in that part of the world, and two of the three largest economies are resident in that part of the world. And of course, uh, five of the United States' seven treaty defense allies are in that region. The facts and figures go on and on and on. You can read them for yourself sometime, but you already know these things. But what's difficult to capture on a website, even one as good as US PACOMs, is how dynamic this region continues to be and how much change the region is undergoing on all fronts, political, economic, and certainly military and security, and how profoundly the developments in the Indo-Asia Pacific region really do affect a wide array of important U.S. national security interests. So continuity and especially change will be the focus of this morning's panel. And over the last few years, there has certainly been a good deal of change in the region to focus our attention. In this regard, we think about the emergence of China as a regional actor of consequence, not just economic and politically, but for the first time in many, many, many years, a regional military actor of consequence. We take note that the government of Prime Minister Abe is looking to rethink the role of Japan's defense and security policies in the region. This is potentially a huge change in the region. India, we recognize, for the last few years has been talking about its Look East policy and thinking about its role in Southeast Asia and East Asia. And of course, our own rebalance to Asia 
is reaffirming the notion that the United States is a Pacific nation and that the policies attendant to that rebalance, economic, diplomatic, and especially military, are aimed at ensuring that the U.S. remains not just a Pacific nation, but a Pacific power. And while the region remains basically at peace, we note that tensions do exist. In fact, we saw that in the recently released national security strategy from the White House last week, which brought our attention to the fact that there are significant maritime tensions over competing sovereignty claims, as well as the perennial problem of a provocative uh, and unpredictable North Korea. It's also worth pointing out that non-traditional security challenges continue to be a constant in this part of the region. Piracy, pandemics, natural disasters, transnational crimes of all sorts continue to plague the region and will continue to be part of the military mission of the U.S. Armed Forces out in that part of the world. And all of these conditions exist in one of the world's most vibrant and dynamic regions of economic development and growth. Now, to help us make sense out of all of this, to help us navigate both the continuities but especially the changes in the region, to assist us in teasing out the implications of these dynamics for U.S. national interests, we are indeed fortunate to have with us today a terrifically accomplished group of naval officers, three flag officers who held significant commands in the Pacific, three officers who have experienced this part of the world from the tactical, operational, and strategic levels, and three officers who made significant contributions to the national security of the United States and, in some cases, to that of some of our allies in the region. They are, as you have read on the program, Admiral Timothy Keating, former PACOM commander, Vice Admiral Douglas Crowder, former commander, 7th Fleet, and Rear Admiral Douglas McEnany, former commander of submarine forces, Pacific. You should have their full biographies in your program, but I would like to highlight a couple of uh, important points about each of them. Uh, first, of course, in the case of Admiral Keating, uh, we note that his career was bookended by duty in the Pacific, serving first as a commissioned officer in Westpac on the USS Mason, DD-852. 36 years later, fast forward, his final assignment on active duty was as U.S. PACOM commander, and in between, a remarkable career that took him around the world in times of peace and also in times of war. A pretty good run. Uh, like Admiral Keating, Vice Admiral Doug Crowder was at one point the N3-N5 at OPNAV, providing him a strategic perch from which to think about this part of the world. He certainly experienced this part of the world from the operational side while commander of 7th Fleet. And of note, Admiral Crowder was deeply engaged in relief efforts after the 2004 tsunami as commander, Combined Support Group Indonesia during Operation Unified Assistance. Last but certainly not least, Rear Admiral McEnany has also dealt with the region across the tactical, operational, and strategic levels. I note that he had four command tours with Pack Fleet over the course of his career. Uh, in addition to his command of all submarine forces in the Pacific, he also commanded, commanded Task Force 74, which, in which he had responsibility for all submarine forces from the international date line all the way to the Suez Canal. That's a lot of water to be in control of. And of course, uh, he surfaced once in a while to take some important uh, assignments ashore as uh, on the joint staff in the J-5 shop and uh, equally important as Commandant of the National War College at Fort McNair, where he was responsible for the professional military education and development of future senior joint leaders. So we have a rich set of issues to deal with today in the Indo-Asia Pacific, and we have a rich set of panelists to mine for their opinions. So having offered that introduction, I'm going to just sit down and pose questions to the uh, distinguished group of admirals on this panel, and we will allow time for questions and answers towards the end. So, okay, we're on. So good morning, admirals. Each of you has served in senior command positions in the region. And as you look out across the region today, what, in your views, gentlemen, are the most significant developments since you departed the AOR? And I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask Admiral Keating to start on this one. It's been uh, five, four and a half years since I left Hawaii, uh, reluctantly. Uh, and and we, uh, like everybody here, we watch it pretty carefully. Uh, 
the most significant changes I would submit are is are is there haven't been all that many significant changes, and I, I think th that would be a cornerstone of any remarks I might make. Yeah, there's things bubble and is Japan getting more muscular? Are is okay? China's building a second aircraft carrier. I say big whoop. Um, the, the, the 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 Japanese. Prime Minister Abe just gave a, his State of the Union speech, and in it, a classic Japanese utterance, change is the only eternal constant. And I would recommend that for serious consideration in thinking about matters attendant to the Indo-Pacific, Asia-Pacific, whatever we, we should call it. I think Indo-Pacific is more appropriate. So in five years, sure, some uh, turmoil, some commotion, some changes, but the fact that we, the Pacific, we, the United States, have been in the Pacific for a long, long time. Our presence is not diminishing much. More on that perhaps a little bit later. But in short, I would say that there have not been all that many significant strategic changes, and that's good, and that's because we are there. Admiral Crowder, uh, what, what's your take on that issue? Yeah. I, I by and large, agree with uh, Admiral Keating. Uh, I would take a, just a, a little bit of a different tack, uh, particularly with India. You know, I really have seen uh, a slow progression of India, and I'll just call it coming out of their shell uh, in uh, five years that I've been gone from the region. Um, you know, I think back uh, uh, to one of the major exercises we have every couple of years out there with the Indians called Malabar. Um, I took it upon myself to invite the Indian fleet commander along with the fleet commanders from Japan and, and Singapore and Australia together. And I kind of surprised, I think, the Indian fleet commander with a press conference. We had previously flown in a couple of cods worth of press. Uh, and the first 74 questions were, is this about China? And the first 74 answers were, oh, of course not. This is about, you know, friends and allies getting together, exercise, I would note that just before the press conference, the Indian Admiral was, this got out, and the Indian Admiral was, was directed not to be part of the press conference. And so when it, I, I was asked by the press, where's the Indian Admiral? After all, this is his exercise. I said, well, I'm the officer conducting the exercise, and I had to turn it over to someone while I came down here for the press conference. And the the Indian fleet commander would be down here after the uh, after the press conference. Uh, that's how reluctant they were in those days. And and you know the president just uh, recently um, had the opportunity to visit India. Uh, the new prime minister Modi is is really I think bringing them out of their shell. There's an opening with Japan. Uh, and quite frankly, I think uh, a decisive movement away from, you know, at least on the military side, with uh, a partnership with, with the Russians. So I see that as a, as a budding change of significance in, in that area. So uh, I'm going to, of course, agree with everything that Admiral Keating <laughs> and Admiral Crowder say uh, here this morning. For once. <laughs> Uh, and and I, I guess I'll, I'll answer this from the standpoint of what I would call significant change, and I, and I compare and contrast that to uh, what I witnessed uh, during my tour as uh, CTF-74 and then the submarine force commander in the Pacific. Uh, I, I would point to uh, the United States Navy and the United States Marine Corps' initiative to uh, conduct training in Darwin, Australia as a pretty significant change uh, since I was in the AOR. And uh, I'll leave it to the audience to decide what sort of signal that might send to others in the region. But uh, I think that's a significant step forward for, uh, for our joint forces in the Pacific. Um, the other thing that strikes me is uh, when I was uh, exec to uh, Admiral Ward, Walt Dorn, uh, we had this bilateral forum called the Western Pacific Naval Symposium. 
that was held on an annual basis, rotated around the AOR. And it was always a curious matter to see who the uh, Chinese would send as their military representative. Uh, usually someone dressed as a naval officer, but then when you asked them what their position was, uh, you didn't get a lot of what I would call fruitful uh, discussion about what that individual had done as a naval officer. I would point to uh, 2014 where the Chinese actually hosted the Western Pacific Naval Symposium in Qingdao and Admiral Wu was a central player in uh, that conference as a pretty significant development, one that I would never have predicted based on uh, my time in the, in the theater, which like Admiral Keating, I think I got on the next airplane. Mine was a commercial aircraft, not a military aircraft, uh, leaving the AOR uh, in uh, 2010. So uh, those are two fairly significant uh, changes that I've noticed, Dave. Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot of meat on the table already. And uh, just, just to pile on with Admiral McEnany, uh, I, I've been looking at uh, China and the Chinese military for about 30 years now. And uh, 10 years ago, if you would have asked me if I could have envisioned uh, Chinese having constant rotations of flotillas going out to the Gulf of Aden, I would have said you're crazy. So uh, I would put into the category of uh, interesting and potentially significant change the rise of the Chinese Navy within the Chinese Armed Forces as an important uh, service that previously was viewed as the stepchild of the PLA, but now is being looked to by the uh, party, the CCP, as being on the, the pointy end of the spear of, of asserting and achieving China's expanding national security interests. So thanks, thanks for pointing that out. So along, along with some of those uh, points, so uh, let, me, let me throw the question back at you all again and say, as you look across the region today, uh, wh what do you see as, as the biggest challenges that, that the U.S. faces? Admiral Crowder, let's, let's go ahead and start with you, because yeah. you're closest to me. Okay. <laughs> Very perceptive, David. Um, <laughs> you know, everyone has been focused, as, as, as uh, all of us were when we were uh, running ships and airplanes and submarines out in the Pacific, with uh, the aggressive claims and ship driving and uh, declared that new ATIS is uh, out in the East China Sea and the South China Sea. Um, and how important that is and how potentially dangerous it is. Uh, I would use as a counterpoint to talk about what I think one of the biggest challenges is how do we collectively face that issue uh, out in the Western Pacific. As Dave mentioned earlier, we have five major mutual defense treaties with, with countries out there, but it's kind of a hub and spoke uh, arrangement. You know, we have a, this relationship with the Japanese, we have this relationship with the Koreans, we have this relationship with the Philippines, with Thailand, with, it, with uh, Australia, and we're the centerpiece of that, but the relationship writ large as a group is, is far from being uh, uh, at the maturity level that perhaps NATO is. Now, that may be good or bad. And the Chinese know that, quite frankly, and they uh, tend to play one off against the other. Anyone who is reading the press uh, can see how, how that happens, particularly with, uh, in an attempt to annihilate Japan from Korea, from Vietnam, and from others. And that's, uh, so for, for, for my view, Dave, being able to bring together and sew together this relationship between our various uh, nations out there is an important task, which, quite frankly, I don't think we've given enough emphasis or have put in the, into the too hard category. So, so alliance management is, is both an imperative and a challenge that, that you think we, we ought to be looking at. And indeed, uh, I'd be surprised if we weren't uh, looking at that very issue up at OPNAV and on the, in the joint world as well. Yeah, uh, Admiral McEnany, uh, your, your thoughts on these issues? Well, for me, at least, oh, by the way, I agree with everything that Admiral Crowder just said. <laughs> I don't know if for I once. said I was going to do that. <laughs> for, for me, uh, the, the country I watch in the region 
that I find most fascinating uh, is North Korea. And uh, I've got to tell you, um, I, I was hoping that uh, the new leadership in North Korea would be uh, uh, perhaps more worldly, perhaps more willing uh, to reach out to others, uh, but it's gotten more bizarre. Um, and uh, I, I think Admiral Crowder would, and Admiral Keating both would probably say that uh, if they had to pull the rabbit out of the hat and which rabbit was going to spoil their Christmas, Thanksgiving, uh, birthday or whatever, it would be the North Koreans. And, uh, you know, it, it's been, it hasn't been that long ago that uh, the North Korea sank the Shonan uh, with the death of 46 uh, Republic of Korea sailors and a uh, midget submarine torpedoed, although I understand the Chinese and the Russians uh, have a different view of what happened, no surprise there. So I worry a lot about North Korea, a nuclear capable North Korea, and uh, if, if that's not the top challenge it, in my book, uh, uh, it should be. The JOs have coined a term, <clears throat> a phrase, that I think is apropos, virtual presence equals actual absence. And if you think about that a little bit, I, I, I believe that, poor, that has uh, ominous overtones for us in the Pacific. Now to back up a little bit, those 36 countries that Dave mentioned, we got to visit almost every one of them, some, some of them many times, uh, and in all of those visits, at one time or another, someone, military guy, diplomat, education official, businessman, would pull me aside and say, <clears throat> you are, you the United States, not just Pacific Command, United States Navy, you are our indispensable partner. So to Doug's point, everybody over there wants us to some degree or another. Now, I'm preaching to the choir, they really like the United States Navy, United States Marine Corps, because we, we might be in port, we might be two miles away, we might be 200 miles away or 2,000 miles away. In the minds of a lot of those folks over there, that's real power. We don't know precisely where you are, but we know you can get here in a hurry and you always come back. Whether it's Doug Crowder helping Aceh in Indonesia, our good friends uh, who took care of our Japanese allies uh, after the uh, uh, Fukushima disaster, or getting a little bit muscular as Taiwan elections are looming by putting three carrier battle groups around the island of Taiwan, the nation of Taiwan. Across the spectrum of presence, it's the United States Navy and United States Marine Corps that carry the day in the Pacific. If we have fewer ships and fewer sailors and Marines, we will not be as capable of presence as we were when I had the privilege of wearing the uniform. Now, one runs the risk as a joint guy of folks saying, well, of course you think that. You know, you've been in the Navy for 42 years. You're, you're saturated with Navy. True and thankfully, but the unmistakable fact is assured access to the maritime domain, presence anywhere in the Asia Pacific region or anywhere around the globe on almost a moment's notice is the indispensable element of our national strategy, and I worry about that decaying gradually over the next five years. Well, we, we certainly heard uh, on uh, the other day uh, Deputy Secretary of Defense uh, Bob Work uh, put out the clarion call that you know, unless we get our, our fiscal house in order and the Pentagon gets its, its budgets that it needs, that we're going to have, have problems uh, uh, maintaining that, that real presence as opposed to the virtual presence. Uh, so, so as I was listening to the three of you, the, the three challenges that I heard were uh, sustaining our presence, managing our alliances, and uh, thinking and planning or worrying about or dealing with managing uh, significant threats, uh, North Korea being right up there, and certainly uh, the national security strategy that was just released by the White House last week. Uh, let, in fact, let me just quote this. Uh, the report cites two security situations that, quote, risk escalation and conflict, unquote. Specifically, 
contested maritime territorial claims, and a provocative North Korea. Uh, I think we both, we all agree that, that those are two, but should, should those two be in the same sentence? No. Can, 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 you, can you talk about <clears throat> that? Yeah, I mean, contested Admiral? maritime complaints, but come on. Uh, if this is the most pressing national security strategy we have, we're in pretty good shape. Uh, I would submit it is not the most pressing national security strategy we have. Can you say Ukraine? Can you say ISIS? Can you say uh, Iran, nuclear pact, heaven forfend? But, but uh, just, just to be clear, that was in the context of the, of the Asia Pacific, I believe, in the section okay, on Asia Pacific. Okay, then I would, uh, oh, all right. Um, North Korea, when I was getting briefs from great folks like now, uh, Admiral Mike Rogers, who was our J2, and spending time with, with Doug and Doug uh, in, the, in the theater. Uh, I was more worried about India-Pakistan, a follow-on of the Mumbai catastrophe where the Indians know that it was a Pakistani-based attack into their country, 150 people, 172, I guess was the number, killed. And, and India, the fact that India would take that, another such attack, and, and not retaliate, I think is a reach. It's India's business, uh, and as Doug alluded in, in his first couple comments. But I, I was more worried about India-Pakistan escalation, nuclear triggers, maybe a little uh, itchier than, than ours, certainly. So I would put North Korea today at the top of the list. I think Sam Lockler would agree. Uh, but contested maritime claims, uh, I, 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 don't, I don't lose any sleep over it. Yeah. And didn't at the, when I was on active duty. Yeah, any any follow-up to that? Yeah. No. Well, I, I think that's right. Uh, it, it gets a lot of it gets a lot of press, and 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 it's it's great video. And we live in a world if it wasn't on video, it didn't happen. Uh, and every time we show a video of a Chinese, uh, you know, white ship going close to one of ours, it becomes a big deal. The larger issue is not that. The larger issue is, in my view, is the PRC's claims. Uh, and building structures and, and using coercion to, 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 to claim and, uh, you know, uh, incredible territory, particularly in the, in the South China Sea. Uh, I wrote an article for proceedings about two years ago that said, you know, we in the United States talk a lot about the Chinese need to be more transparent. Well, we need to be more transparent. Okay, PRC. We're not going to stand for this. We're not going to stand for your co yeah, good. coercion of our allies and friends in that area out. Uh, and since I wrote that article, not that I think the White House is a subscriber <laughs> to proceedings, Peter, uh, they get a free copy? OK. Uh, what about, I don't get a free copy. Uh, oh, it's on the merit system, OK. Um, your dues are paid up. But, but I will tell you, since then, we've become a little more public uh, on that, uh, at least in the last year, uh, I, I've heard those sorts of deals. But if we don't do that, and if we don't state that publicly and often, uh, you know, the Chinese are going to think there's no penalty for it, one. And two, and probably more importantly, our friends and allies, especially the smaller countries, the Vietnams, the Malaysias, uh, the Philippines, uh, uh, they're going to have to make a decision whether they make a deal with the Chinese or not. And if, if they feel like they have to make a deal, it probably won't be a good deal for them. So okay. that's my, my response so to th that. These, these are great comments. So, so my response to, to your response is that, yes, as I, as I reel back the tape, I, I think you're quite correct. I think uh, uh, Assistant Secretary of State Danny Russell has been pretty vocal in stating publicly <coughs> Uh, publicly and on the record, uh, the U.S. position on on the use of coercion to solve maritime claims. Um, but as I listen to all of you, you know, I'm listening to, to the maritime claims in North Korea. It, it just underscores that in the Pacific region, the U.S. forces have to be prepared to deal with a, a very wide and broad range of contingencies from low intensity conflict all the way to the possibility of, of, of confrontation in North Korea, which, by the way, would involve uh, uh, nuclear nuclear uh, capable countries, the U.S., North Korea, right, and uh, and China, which would not be a disinterested party. So there's a wide spectrum of, of force options that, that Pacific Command and its commander and its component services have to deal with, and, and that takes us sort of back back to the rebalance, which took a prominent part 
or at least was prominently displayed in the national security strategy. Uh, where, where do you see the rebalance uh, going well? Where, where do you think it's falling short? I, I think it's an unfortunate term. As we all, though, uh, certain uh, senior officials were quick to say, no, 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 we didn't, we didn't, we didn't say pivot. Well, there's evidence to the contrary. <laughs> they, they backed away from it and said it's, it's, it's really a rebalance. I don't think that's a, a good term either for what it's worth. And, and like Doug, I, I noticed no one's calling me to ask my opinions on, any, on this stuff anymore, but you're going to get it. Um, I think reemphasis is perhaps closer to the term. It's not like all of a sudden we woke up one morning about a year and a half ago and went, you know, oy vey, there's this great body of water out there surrounded by active, dynamic uh, economies and environmental challenges and so on. So uh, Sam Locklear and the guys at Pacific, guys and girls at Pacific Camp would tell you that there is indeed a shift in force structure to the Asia-Pacific region. Now, we're not going to get many more bases over there. You know, the Fatenma issue continues to kind of bubble along. Uh, I'm of the opinion we won't see Marines in Guam in my lifetime and, and shouldn't, uh, but that may inflame some. Um, is certain to inflame certain folks. Anyway, pivot, bad term. Rebalance, not so much. Reemphasis, I happen to I prefer because I think it emphasizes the correct mindset that we have been in the Pacific, we are in the Pacific, we remain in the Pacific, and there are certain forces that have been there in some numbers. The numbers are increasing, more subs. Uh, the, the George Washington Battle Group is the most, uh, uh, they got all the newest stuff. Uh, and they're going to get another carrier here soon that's been recently refitted. So, don't like pivot, didn't care for rebalance, like reemphasis. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm pretty much in the same place. Uh, it, it's more about, uh, if, if I don't have a tally, if you looked at the last 10,000 NSC meetings, how many were the subject were, to, were the Pacific, I would think that uh, a one-armed man could probably handle that number. Uh, so it was kind of delegated to the, in, to the good hands of the Tim Keatings of the world, uh, and, and that was fine. Uh, now it's, it's uh, you know, they're trying to bring it on to the natural consciousness, and particularly into, the, you know, the, the parlors in Washington to talk about it. It has always been there. I agree with Tim. It's, it's not an issue of of rebalancing, it's, it's now a new awareness. Oh my gosh, there's that big lake out there and there's a lot of things going on out there. So I think it's finally making the to-do list, uh, particularly in Washington, and, and, is the issue. And of course, there's, there's sort of a rebalance within the rebalance. And, and if you read the, uh, the uh, papers coming out of the administration that there was a feeling, apparently, that, that our traditional emphasis on Northeast Asia uh, needed to be balanced within the region to appreciating the importance of Southeast Asia. And so, uh, and of course, that's very maritime, and so that puts, uh, puts the Navy, once again, at, uh, at the front of the line for taking care of this. Admiral McInerney? Yeah, I, as I look at it, Dave, to me, what's uh, striking is uh, that the threat of terrorism has continued to dog this entire administration and certainly the one before it. So I think there was maybe a thought uh, when the president introduced this initiative that uh, we were ending conflict in Iraq and Afghanistan and the world was going to be a better place. And then the next thing you know, you have this ISIS threat. And I think that does get in the way of the administration's plans and the military's plans for the Asia-Pacific region. The other, the other uh, part of this, and Admiral Keating spoke about it, but it's, it's sort of tied up in this, this ugly thing called sequestration, which makes it very, very hard for our military forces to plan for anything. Because year to year, they're not sure what's, what resources they're going to be provided for executing plans that they would like to execute. So uh, I think that's been a challenge. And then finally, uh, you know, I look at what's going on. Admiral Keating mentioned this already, but it's, it's the Russia that we're dealing with today. 
I think uh, most of us who were around for the Cold War thought uh, Russia was going to be our friend. Uh, you know, uh, in the early 90s, there certainly was hope for that. But uh, I think Russia has been occupying a significant amount of bandwidth for this uh, administration, and so the whole issue of rebalancing tends to be in the back seat. That's great. Thanks. So uh, let me shift gears just a little bit. I think that uh, humanitarian assistance and disaster relief operations will undoubtedly continue to be part and parcel of, of the enduring missions for our forces in the Pacific Command uh, area of operations. So uh, I was wondering if, if those of you who have been involved in these could share your thoughts and some of the lessons you've learned about uh, dealing with HADR missions, uh, the, the, the challenges uh, to include alliance management, and, and what you think uh, you'd like to share with folks about, about how we should go about these in the future. You best. Um, you know, uh, this is something I've studied uh, and watched from afar, uh, you know, since the, the uh, tsunami relief operation that, we, that we, my battle group was uh, involved in in 2004, 2005. Here's kind of what I've taken from the subsequent ones. Uh, one, it's about speed to action. Uh, we can be a lumbering giant sometimes as we figure out how to get a JTF stood up and get them on an airplane and, you know, and get the troops out of fort whatever. And, and meanwhile, day after day after day, where are the Americans? And we saw that in spades with the national press uh, not too long ago when Diane Sawyer was, where are the Americans? Well, we we're still trying to plan how to do this. So speed to action. Even if you got one helicopter there, did I mention if it ended on video, it didn't happen? Uh, uh, get, get, get there quick with what you can right away and start doing something. So speed to action. C2, command and control. For reasons which are unclear to me, um, even at this late stage of my life, uh, we tend to want to put command and control ashore in places that have been wiped out by, by a disaster. Uh, so we got to bring it from somewhere. We got to hook it up, or there's no power. And uh, even in the uh, tsunami relief, the JTF commander went to Thailand, and I didn't talk to him for about 11 days as he was getting his command and control up. We saw the same thing in Haiti. So even if you wanted an army general to run it, army general, please come to the the carrier, we've got command and control. We can, you can run it from here until you get your bivouac up and running ashore, if you like. So speed, command and control. And the last thing is risk. When you say, well, what about risk? You know, we're pretty good at taking risks. We're pretty good at taking risk in the high-end side of things. We're willing to fly into that, that uh, SAM envelope if we have to. We're willing to go into harm's way. We're willing to put a ship in close. Um, but when you do HADR, sometimes you gotta take risks, especially in a post-2001. Uh, I'll give you an example. On the front page of the Washington Post during the tsunami relief in, in Indonesia was a picture of a, of a naval aviator crewman carrying a woman into a helicopter. On the front page of the Washington Poster in this latest Haiti one was five soldiers, chin straps, helmets, guns, going ashore. They were the, H -A they were the force protection footprint before the first helicopter got there. We got to be able to take risks uh, when we do HADR. Uh, I, I, would, I would opine that most people who suffer from a tsunami, if you're coming with, with fresh water and goods, you don't need a, you don't need a, a, a piece with you. Uh, and we gotta be willing to take that risk. So, so let me sum up what I think we've just heard and should call the Crowder Doctrine for HADR. And I'm gonna add a fourth to it. Uh, the first is speed to action. Uh, second is command and control. A third is risk, and the fourth one that you, you alluded to twice, but you didn't give it its own number, was strategic communications. Yeah. All right? 
So you heard it here first at uh, West 2015, folks, the Crowder Doctrine on HADR. Admiral Keating, what, what do you want to yeah. throw in on that? Yeah. Wouldn't be a good panel without a couple of sea stories. I, <clears throat> prior to Pacific Command, I had the privilege of living in Colorado Springs. It was a pretty nice place to live. Uh, us Navy guys didn't know much about Colorado Springs. And this thing called Katrina happened. Uh, we could go on and on and on about Katrina. Don't believe everything you read or hear, Brian Williams notwithstanding. Um, uh, he's probably not getting an entirely fair grab here. But uh, the first folks on the scene, uh, Nora Tyson happened to be in command of the, I forget the, the ship, but Baton, thank you. And she was, for some reason or another, doing an exercise, doing some training in the Gulf of Mexico. I don't know why she was there, but she was. And she called us, Turk Green picked up the phone. Before the storm hit, she was moving baton in the wake, literally in the wake of the, of the hurricane, because she knew something was going to happen, and she had helicopters and a big hospital uh, facility on her ship. So nobody told her that she just started going to the, where the sound of the guns was going to be. Nora Tyson and, and kids, not just Navy, but Marines and Air Force uh, folks manned up helicopters and just started flying to to the scene of, of the disaster. That, that, that's well, a great vignette, Admiral. I, I've never heard this, and I, and I think that many to other, have the other folks of being true. It, so this is great. Yeah. Second sea story. Um, there was a cold snap in uh, uh, Guangzhou, China, some will remember, and then there was a big earthquake uh, to the, in the central highlands of China. And one of the great things about being Pacific Command Commander is all, you have OpCon, or as Pete Pace called it, ChokeCon. Uh, you, you can get stuff moving without having to ask anybody. You just say, launch the C-17s out of Alaska. Load, before you launch them, load them up with all sorts of MREs and blankets and tents and send them, get them going. So inside of 24 hours, from, from you remember the pictures, there were uh, hundreds of thousands of people marooned at the train station because it was a big Chinese holiday and they were all going to try and go back to their, and the trains were uh, <laughs> stranded and so they're, 300, that's a, a minor city stuck at Guangzhou. We, we had C-17s in the air headed to China within 24 hours, loaded up, and I got on the, quote, China hotline. It's only a hotline if the guy on the other end picks it up. <laughs> uh, and they didn't. It rang, I swear, you can check, uh, check with Greg Nosell. It rang for 45 minutes, the red switch, just rang and rang and rang. Somebody finally picked it up, you know, ni hao. <laughs> I say that right? <laughs> Close enough. Um, and we said, I hope you'll give these airplanes permission to enter your airspace because they have relief supplies for your, for your citizens in Guangzhou. Long, stunned silence. And the guy, it, uh, it was Lieutenant General Ma at the time, the kind of the director of their right. joint staff. Ma, Ma Xiao Tian. Yeah. He said, how did you know about this and how is it you can move this quickly? Speed, command and control. And this is a great advantage of forces that are in place, trained, and equipped. We don't have to ask many folks permission to get certain things moving. And we got them moving. In the case of Katrina, and in the case of the cold snap, and in the case of the earthquake, we had stuff in the air before the hurricane hit in Louisiana and worse, Mississippi. Don't ever forget, Mississippi took the brunt of that blow. And in China, you can get stuff going before the Chinese themselves really know the gravity of the situation. So I'll, I'll jump in on the train with uh, Admiral Keating and I'll tell one quick sea story uh, about Doug Crowder's tsunami relief in 2004 and, and perhaps something that uh, strikes me as necessary and Admiral Keating's really alluded to it and that's relationships. If you don't have a relationship with the country you're trying to help, it makes it very, very hard to render assistance. And minding my own business in Makalapa in 2004 on Christmas Day, I got a call from the front office. Christmas Day, it's nobody's supposed to be at work. It was the Admiral's aide saying, hey, uh, EA, you need to get in here because we've got some uh, pretty serious business related to this tsunami that we all heard about this morning. And uh, as I like to tell Doug, uh, from Makalapa, uh, the front end of the tsunami relief was not going very well. Uh, 
Doug was uh, on the Abraham Lincoln enjoying a port visit in Hong Kong, as I recall. And uh, the only person that had a relationship in Indonesia, and this was in the wake of uh, the Leahy Amendment uh, that, that uh, was part of some of the atrocities that occurred in East Timor many years before, but there, were, there was literally a generation of TNI uh, military who did not know us. And the only person that knew someone in Indonesia in uniform that was willing to talk to the United States was Admiral Fargo and his relationship with General Sutarto. And it took a hell of a lot of effort, and I would, you know, Doug didn't mention it, but one of the things I recall very, very clearly about our relief effort in Aceh province was the fact that every person had to be off the ground when the sun went down at night. So all military lift had to be out, and, and all people had to be out and they were flown back to the carrier. So every day we flew people in and out. And to me, that's a relationship issue. You contrast that with Fukushima and, and the relief effort there, uh, that was all about relationships. And our relationship with Japan, of course, is very, very good. So I think the relationship piece is very important to HADR efforts. Uh, I just want to, one quick uh, uh, story uh, relating to what uh, Admiral Keating just said about how easy it is to move forces that are already there. Uh, as Doug McEnany mentioned, uh, we were enjoying a wonderful port visit in uh, Hong Kong. Uh, when this happened, I got a phone call from the 7th Fleet Commander who uh, was then uh, John Greenard, who I've lost track of him since then. He went <laughs> off to subsequent jobs. Um, and, and how I was told to get underway and go to Indonesia, and I believe this to be a direct quote from, from Greenard to me on the red switch. Why don't you get underway? I don't know if they're going to need us or not but why don't you mosey on down that way? <laughs> now, I went to my Dick Nav Ab, that's the Dictionary of Naval Abbreviations, to look up mosey and was unable to find it, but I had an Army, army officer on my staff, and, and that, I guess that's a term in the Army, to mosey. Uh, I, so, was, I was moseyed many times. Oh, were you? Okay. Um, so we got underway, and my definition of mosey was 32 knots. Uh, <laughs> Greener called me the next day, says, okay, I think they're going to need you. Uh, when can you be in the Straits of Malacca? Uh, I, I would be in the Straits of Malacca. Uh, so anyway, I just, I'm just to foot stomp uh, Admiral Keating's point. No, that, that's terrific. And so we're, we're going to add uh, relationships to the, uh, as the fifth for HADR. So uh, let, let, me, let me throw this one at you. So I, I was recently at a conference in China, and a very articulate officer in the People's Liberation Army uh, said the following to me. He said, Dave, uh, the US government, and the Pentagon especially, is always asserting, asserting that in Asia, US forward military presence and the US alliance system is a force for stability in the region. But, he said to me, the Americans never explain how. You guys just assert this. How should I have responded to that? You should have said, thank you very much. You're exactly right. <laughs> he is. I mean, that's, that's what we do. And it goes to the relationship. You, you, you can't pick up a phone and call somebody if you've not met them. You can't get underway out of Hong Kong at 32 knots if you're, if you're not familiar with the dynamic. He's exactly right. And I would congratulate him on his uh, perception. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess... Uh, I would tell him, Dave, to go talk to our allies in the region. You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't dignify that question with an answer. I would just say, have you talked to our allies? Yeah. What do they think? That's right. Uh, let me take, take that one. I get two quick quips. Uh, one, as Doug McEnany mentioned, uh, it was illegal to talk to um, 
uh, by congressional language, I was not allowed by the Leahy Amendment to talk to uh, Indonesian uh, Army officers uh, when we started this, this tsunami relief, which I discarded knowing full well that someone would protect me, I hoped. Uh, or I could work in my father-in-law's drugstore. <laughs> so I had a backup plan. Um, you know, three or four years later, when I was a Seventh Fleet commander, uh, went back to Indonesia for, uh, you know, and, and the defense minister threw a nice little reception, and, and uh, one uh, Indonesian gentleman, uh, older man, came up to me, gave me his card, and it just said, counselor at large to the president. I wish I had a card that said that. I guess you can get them made up. He said, I wonder if I could uh, have a minute of your time. I said, absolutely. He says, not here. I said, okay, you want to come by my hotel? He says, no, let's go back behind the garden. So we started walking back and my protection detail was coming with me and I said, I can take this guy if, if necessary. <laughs> and so we go back, all the way back, as far as you can get away from the, where the poo-poos were. And he said, uh, listen, this is what I want to tell you. He said, he said, don't ever leave this region. And I said, you mean you want us to, to have more port visits here in Indonesia? He goes, no, I don't want that. But we know you're there, and everyone else knows you're there. Don't ever leave this area. And I took that, uh, you know, to heart. My other little quip was, uh, for those who don't know, the Singapore government built a pretty fine facility called Chang'e. Uh, I had the opportunity to meet with the Minister of Defense uh, when our flagship went there and tied up in Chang'e. Uh, and it has all the facilities needed for a nuclear power aircraft carrier. And so I made a call on the Defense Minister and I thanked him for building this uh, this facility for us and our carriers. He was very quick and very sharp. I did, we did not build this for the United States Navy. Any country in the world that has a Nimitz class carrier can, <laughs> can bring their carriers here. That's great. Uh, so so the, word, the word that sort of comes to mind as I listen to these uh, sea stories is that what, what the U.S., and tell me if you, if you disagree, what, what the U.S. is providing with its forward military presence and with its alliance system is reassurance. Uh, reassurance to the region that uh, we're going to be there to provide uh, stability and support uh, through natural disasters, uh, to be there in the neighborhood, uh, to, to provide a sense of reassurance in the shadow of rising powers. Uh, there's, there's a couple, not just one and that uh, maintaining our relationships will be critical to everything we've talked about so far. So, so let me just, and we've, we're, gonna, we're gonna segue into audience questions in just a moment, but I just wanna throw one, one more, one more at, at the panel. Uh, I, I, I was particularly taken with uh, Admiral Keating's uh, uh, sea story about sending uh, relief supplies into China. I think we did that also during the, uh, the terrible earthquakes in Sichuan uh, a couple of years after after the Guangzhou deep freeze, and so it, it seems to me that that uh, the larger U.S.-China relationship is going to continue to be comprised of a tangled and messy web of issues, which on the one hand uh, will impel us to cooperate when, in those cases, our respective national interests intersect, but it's also going to be comprised of a uh, set of issues that will engender uh, terrific competition and contention. And so uh, how, how, does, uh, how do you see uh, us managing all of, all of this? It's a very complex uh, dance that, that both Beijing and Washington are dancing. Uh, how, wh what, what is your prescription for uh, success in managing this, gentlemen? Uh, it's steady as she goes, from my view. Um, if you put yourself in uh, President uh, Xi Jinping's, you know, he goes to sleep at night uh, and his red switch rings at 3 o'clock in the morning. And as he's waking up and reaching for it, what are his initial thoughts? We've all gotten phone calls, whether in Liberty in Hong Kong, but the, the dreaded red switch in the middle of the night. Is it likely to be something to do with an issue concerning the United States Department of Defense 
as opposed to regime survival, energy, environment, demographics, social unrest. Uh, I, my, my way of thinking about it was he's got a lot of issues on his plate over which to say grace and military confrontation with the United States and or our allies, because I don't think you can separate them. I think the Chinese know that. The, the, that's a very small piece of uh, the pie over which he has to uh, be concerned. So uh, just hold what we've got. Don't for, do not relent ever, ever, when the Chinese want to put a finger in our chest uh, or, or they, you go to China and they say, well, this pivot to the Pacific, it's really just about containing China. No, it's not. They flatter themselves. It's not just about that. Maybe that's a part of it, but it's not. You take Malabar, connect the dots of the countries that participated, United States, Japan, Australia, Singapore, India. If you're in Beijing, what does that look like? Well, it's a dotted line surrounding China. Okay, that's all right to think of it that way. Maybe there is an element of that. So hold what we've got. Don't relent. Treat them with respect, but don't ever, ever, ever take a position of retracting from or, or shying away from addressing an issue directly with them. Admiral McNamara. Okay, so truth in advertising, since I left the Navy, I work for a company that does work in China. So um, I, w I wanted to say that up front. Um, you know, I guess what I would say, Dave, is that I am encouraged by China. I know there are people out there who worry about China. I think there's a right to be worried about China. There are certainly some thorny issues that we need to work with China on. But I would say, looking back on my time in the AOR, there was very little dialogue uh, that went on at mill-to-mill -mill levels. I've seen a dramatic change since I left almost five years ago now. And I'm encouraged by the Chinese. I'm encouraged by their military and the fact that they're willing to meet with us. And they're willing to meet with us at the appropriate level. So I, I couldn't agree more with what Admiral Keating said. I think we steady as you go. Don't set the bar so high that you'll never achieve have modest expectations, but continue the dialogue and continue to work with China. They're very, very important to us. The terrific comments. Yeah. And Admiral Crowder, I'll give you the last word on this one and then we'll yeah. open it up. Okay, I, I would invoke the Susan Crowder rule of international relations. Susan Crowder, I'm, I'm uh, Susan Crowder's starter husband and have been for 39 years now. And she used to complain that I never said no to the kids because I'd come back for the appointment and I'd been gone a long time and I wanted them to love me and I always said yes. And she was the no, the no person in our household. And I always thought that was a big risk she was taking because they wouldn't love her as much as dad who never said no. But I was wrong, they, that didn't end up being the case. And I would kind of, you know, I'm being a little cute by half here but we got to be willing to say no to folks, uh, in particular the PRC, when it's time to say no. That doesn't mean that we don't love you and we don't want to get along, but no, uh, we're not going to stand for you, uh, you know, using coercion in, in that area. And it's fine, we can get on on other things, but no, we're not going to do it. So that's my parting shot. Okay, great. So let's, let's open it up. And, uh, yeah, so if, if you'd like to ask a question, uh, raise your hand. I'll try to recognize you. Uh, hopefully my peripheral vision will, will uh, cooperate. And when you do ask your question, please try to get to the microphone, uh, state your name and your position uh, if you care to. Sir. Gentlemen, good morning. Major Brian Henserling. Um, I assure you that I don't typically do this with a group of admirals, men such as yourselves, but I'm going to ask that you humor me for just a moment. Um, let's say, despite your assertions to the contrary, that the White House did call each of you and ask for your input on what changes you might see happening over the course of the next 10 years. Uh, how do you see the balance of power evolving in uh, the Pacific? How do you see that balance of power change uh, informing our strategic uh, objectives? And 
what sorts of uh, goals we should have in the region. And then because of both of those things, what kind of opportunities do you see for the Navy Marine Corps team to build better relationships, deeper relationships, and deeper ties with our partners in the, in the region? Doug Crowder uh, highlighted an important uh, issue, Brian, I think uh, would address your thoughtful questions. Uh, India. They're out there on the kind of the western flank of the Pacific Command AOR, if you will. Uh, huge country, population booming, economy getting place, getting better. Uh, if you've ever been in India for national elections, it, it's an astounding sight. They have a very high percentage of their people who vote. Many of them can't read, so they go into the ballot box, and, and candidates are identified by symbols, either an orange circle or a green triangle. And the folks who can't read the name Doug Crowder, they see the green triangle and they vote for Doug Crowder. Hundreds of millions of people in India vote for every national election. So paying close attention to India, tough to work with, fiercely non-aligned, proud sovereign nation, got all that. They are uh, coming around gradually to the clear and I think appropriate realization that we are an indispensable partner of theirs. So. In, in the five to ten years that you're discussing, pay attention to India. Also, watch Japan very carefully for reasons that I think everybody can figure out. In, in, in all of those visits, again, someone would pull me aside and say, you're not leaving Japan, are you? You're going to keep a large presence in Japan? There, there are many concerns subtly couched in that very important question. We need to stay very close with Japan. Anybody else? Well, I would just, uh, you know, obviously I agree with Admiral Keating's comments on India's rise. Um, but I would say, uh, you know, there's a general understanding that Russia is not a reliable ally uh, in that area. Uh, as I look maybe 10 years out, uh, uh, where's Japan going to be? Is it going to be brought into? you know, a normal relationship uh, with the countries out there. I hope that that's the case. Uh, and it's not a to counter China, but it might help China to understand that uh, there's a peaceful way forward. We can help them with that. Uh, there doesn't have to be fisticuffs in order to ensure the viability and growth of China. Uh, and so, what happens with Japan, uh, I think, is going to be critical, and it's worth keeping an eye on. Yeah, I, I guess I would echo uh, to what uh, Admiral Keating and Admiral Crowder said. I, I guess what I look at is, first and foremost, is China. You know, they have a quasi-aircraft carrier now. There's reports in the press that they're going to have their own indigenous built from the ground up aircraft carrier by 2020. I mean, that's a pretty clear and unmistakable signal to our allies in the region and to the United States Navy. Uh, and I think we need to keep an eye on China, as we have, uh, and as our allies expect us to do, and see where uh, their mili military aspirations lead. Uh, there's no question that the trajectory that they're on right now, if sustained, is going to be a much more muscular China in the region. And from a balance of power standpoint, that's going to be a big challenge to the militaries in the region. Uh, Dr. Davis, with the permission of the court, uh, I just got an intel burst that, Brian, you may know something about this part of the world. How would you answer your question? Uh, what, now maybe before Doug may be able to tell everybody else what he just told me. Yeah. Brian's a Olmstead scholar uh, and spent, where, where was your university? Which university was it? Uh, in, in Brussels, Belgium, sir. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were in China. But, no. But an Olmstead scholar spent I'm not two that years, much of a mole. Spent two years in a foreign country as a foreigner and in, in attending a foreign university in that language. So uh, Brussels. 
That must have been tough duty. Yeah, it was, it was real rough. And the Olmstead Scholar rough. Program, we currently have five young uh, military junior officers studying in China right so now. So how do you answer the question? Well, sir, very specifically thinking about uh, opportunities for increased engagement and things like that. I, I read an article in the Marine Corps Gazette a few months back about um, in, increased training with the Japanese uh, military to uh, give them kind of a MAGTAF MU concept. Um, things like that. We you gentlemen already spoke about Darwin and increased training there. Um, uh, the possibility, uh, which uh, unlikely though it may be, of moving Marines from Okinawa back to Guam. All those those kinds of things. I, I think the the Japanese military over the next couple of years certainly Admiral Keating is is one to watch uh, for a more muscular uh, muscular posture within the region, and, and uh, Admiral Crowder also was talking about the, uh, the issues and the tensions between the Japanese and the Koreans and the Chinese and how that whole issue will play out. But I, I think India and, and Japan are the two biggest possibilities for, for change. But I'm just, I'm just agreeing with the admirals on the panel. There's a lot of that going around, on around here. So uh, thank you, sir. Thanks for that question, Major. That's terrific. Sir? Thank you. Uh, Captain Chris Bolt, I'm the commanding officer there, Ronald Reagan, parked right across the water here. I thought I'd, I'd ask the question that's very related, almost the same question. I was an FDNF sailor before, I'm going to be an FDNF sailor again. Uh, we've established kind of a battle rhythm, a routine of annual exercises, biannual exercises, traditional port visits. Would you gentlemen recommend a change to how we allocate our time and energy? Uh, very similar, I, I like the India answer that, hey, maybe we should do more stuff in the Indian Ocean as we look at uh, the Darwin facilities being built up there, maybe that's that. Are there any other changes that if you could take a step back and say, hey, we've got Malabar, we've got Annual X, we've got all these exercises, would you make any changes, either making them bigger, smaller, or reapportion them to different nations that are in that theater? So I'm just trying to get my charts ready, that's it. <laughs> So you're, you're going to the Blue Ridge is, uh, or in some capacity? or? Yeah, so uh, I'm the, the CEO of the aircraft carrier that's going to replace the George Washington. Oh, okay. And Got we it. head over there in August. Got it. So. Good for you. You need a, you need a mess cook? Deal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll, 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 I'll start, Chris. I, um, off the top of my head, no. Um, more, more are generally better than less. Though a rim pack every other year uh, is a huge deal, and we reap, we the United States, United States Navy, Marine Corps, we reap huge benefits from that Pacific Fleet exercise. Uh, I, I think if you were talking to Harry Harris today and Pink Floyd, I talked to Pink, I don't know, a week or two, I don't know if he's been around, they're already planning the next rim pack, already. And they, you know, they're still sweeping up the, from the after action party. I don't, were you in? Did you guys play in rim pack? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, we do as much as we can. We would like to do more. We would ask more of you. But you got to get into Hong Kong every once in a while. You got to get into Singapore. You got to get to Perth. And time distance heading being what it is, and you got to watch your plant. So, long answer, short question. We're about as, probably as good as we can get. We want to explore more opportunities. We need to bring China in, let them leave the AGI home. We don't necessarily, but they're allowed to bring it over. I mean, it's great. We bring more is better in a way. So, it's about right, I think, but we ought to keep our eyes and ears open for more opportunities. Chris, I think there's, there's been a bit of dynamism going on. We've got now a, a uh, permanently stationed destroyer squadron staff in Singapore who really tends full time now to, to the Southeast Asia nations planning bi, you know, a series of bilaterals and, when possible, regional exercises and just another uh, planning staff and a major commander who, who can be in more places than just, uh, just the CTF commanders and the and the Seven Fleet commander and the PACOM. So I think that is starting to pay huge dividends as uh, as we've made that investment. As just one example. And, and I guess what I would throw in, Chris, is uh, I think if you go back and look at the history of our exercises in the AOR. 
you're going to find that over the years they've gotten much more complex with many, many more forces involved. Uh, you know, I would point to ASW as a great example. Uh, when Doug Crowder was my boss as a Seventh Fleet commander, uh, and we did, uh, and I forget the name of the exercise, the annual X was, uh, that was a very, very robust exercise with a lot of ASW play, both by the Japanese and the U.S. forces, with uh, a lot of opposition submarines out there. So uh, the realism that that provided, I think, uh, was very, very valuable to both the Kaijo Jetai and uh, the United States Navy. And so over the years, it's sort of incremental change, but we have really ratcheted up uh, the complexity of these exercises. Thank you, sir. sir. Thanks, Bruce. Uh, Bruce Rennie, San Diego Navy League. Uh, question for Admiral Crowder. Uh, about a year ago, there were some report, media reports from unnamed sources at 7th Fleet that LCS didn't really fit the needs of uh, that area of operations. Uh, can you comment on what you think, your opinion on LCS and what its role is in that area? Well, my understanding there is no longer an LCS. Is that not correct? Have we, we baptized them in, as frigates? Okay, a little, little, little fun. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, there's a uh, forward presence from left to right, as Admiral Keating says, from that carrier strike group all the way down to what I think is a pretty powerful uh, forward presence element, a single marine in dress blues. Uh, the LCS, there's a lot that the LCS can do, it, particularly uh, you know, in that Southeast Asia uh, area. You know, I, I heard many complaints when I was there. We do an exercise with one of the smaller nations and we send a Aegis cruiser and, and their Navy, you know, it was almost taken as an insult. You know, you bring an Aegis cruiser and we got four gunboats uh, type of thing. So there's a lot of things that, that these ships can do. Uh, you know, Admiral Roden was here. I, I don't know if he's still here. Admiral Roden uh, talked about this on Tuesday, I think, Tom, about upgunning and putting some more uh, lethality uh, uh, on these frigates. Uh, and I think that's a plan that's, a, that's in place and going to happen. The more credible combat power it gives, it's the further it can do missions along that spectrum. But Clearly, I'd rather have a, an LCS, a.k.a. frigate, out there in that AOR than virtual presence that Admiral Keating talked about. Thank you. And I think we have time for one more question, so we'll ask the Coast Guard to make it a, uh, a full deck of the sea services for question ask askers. All right. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Lieutenant Commander Craig Allen, Coast Guard. Uh, so, in the last couple of years, we've seen China kind of taking a two-fold strategy. On the one hand, it's looking to challenge some of our uh, hard power capabilities in terms of its A2AD and it's uh, what some have called it. You can't hear the question. Excuse me. Oh, that's better. Okay. Um, so we've seen China take a two-fold strategy uh, in terms of countering some of our, our influence in the region. Uh, on the one hand, it's, in, it's uh, increasing its A2AD capability to kind of uh, challenge our ability to have assured access in the region. But it's also taken a, a soft power strategy, and it's using some non-traditional elements of power. For example, uh, its fishing fleet, its newly formed Coast Guard, even things like uh, mobile oil rigs uh, to uh, exert influence in the region. So do we think, uh, in your, from your perspective, uh, we have the preponderance of power projection capability in the region? Do we also have the soft power tools that we need to uh, engage them on sort of that opposite, beyond the combat power front? Well, folks wrestle with this uh, anti-access area denial piece. Um, it's on the list of things that John Greenert and, and, uh, and the Commandant of the Marine Corps and Commandant of the Coast Guard have to address. That's you know, it's clearly a factor. But I, I think you know, that it, if you believe that there's only one way for our Navy, Marine Corps, and Coast Guard to fight, and you want to counter that one way, and you put all your eggs in that basket, well, you may have a successful strategy. But I think you missed the point by 
ignoring the other ways that we can come after you if we want to get to that point. And the, the more complicated we make their problem, the better chances we have of succeeding and even more importantly, that they don't, they get out of bed in the morning and they say, I, we can't win today. We can't win today. Every day that we have the, anybody get out of bed and go, no, we're not going to win today, that's a day in our favor. And the more complex, the more dynamic, the more agile, the broader spectrum of issues with which we confront them, the better for us. I remember being asked by a Japanese reporter once, actually it was on a television program, they were kind of 60 minutes version. Um, it was one of these typical questions that was about a two minute statement about how powerful the Chinese have become and aren't you worried and, and they've got, you know, anti-access, uh, area denial and they got ships here and they're building ships and 11% uh, per annum increase in defense budget, you know. Uh, what do you think? You're running scared there, uh, Seventh Fleet Commander? And my answer was, if I had to pick a team, I'd pick the team I'm on. Because uh, we show a lot of leg, but we don't show all the leg, if you know what I mean. In your, your, your comment about soft power, uh, the Doug Crowder's view, uh, the Chinese were embarrassed by the, by the uh, Asian tsunami relief operations. Uh, the U.S., first of all, got a lot of great press, a lot of goodwill. Uh, have, it was the really sort of the the flame that started a relationship between the United States, uh, you know, renewed a relationship that had gone hollow between the United States and Indonesia. Did I mention Indonesia is the largest Muslim country in the world, 280 million uh, who think, you know, relatively highly of the United States. And the Chinese weren't there. Now, what do you think the first ship that went, was built in the next Chinese palm cycle? Daishandao. Hospital ship. Peace Ark. Okay. Hospital ship. Yeah. So I'm more than willing to that the Chinese spend a little money and a little time and effort uh, on their soft power. Works for me. Uh, but I can tell you there's, I don't know what the current count is, 285 U.S. Navy vessels currently, and every one of them can do HADR. Okay. I don't know. Okay. So, so I'm going to turn this back over to you because it's 11:30 and we're right on time. So, over to you, Paul. Dr. Finkelstein and uh, distinguished members of the panel, uh, I would uh, simply like to uh, add uh, my thanks uh, as well as the thanks of the U.S. Naval Institute and AFSEA for taking the time to join us today and engage in this uh, very fascinating and enlightening discussion. So uh, would everybody please join me in uh, thanking uh, the panel again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.